gracious God, we pray that you would open us up this morning. God, that you would open our eyes to see and open our ears to hear. God, we pray that you would open up our hearts to feel your presence with us, within us. And then, God, that you would open our hands that we might go out into the world and serve others in your name. Amen. So, uh, like many of you, perhaps, I was um, at a neighbor's house last Saturday on the opening day of college football, watching football games. And um, one thing that you need to know about the Amersons is that we are a cableless family. Uh, we, we survive somehow off of a Netflix subscription and the five channels that our digital antenna receives and, um, and the Comcast password that I borrow from my parents. Um, <laughs> but it's not really important for uh, this sermon. Uh, for you to know that, but um, what that what that means though is that uh, very rarely do we see commercials anymore because pretty much everything that we watch in the Amerson house is commercial free. About the only time we see commercials anymore is when we're watching live sports, and that's what we were doing last Saturday. And so uh, during a break from the game, uh, it went to the commercials, and um, a commercial came on, one that, that many of you in here have probably seen before. It starts with two people, a couple sitting. Uh, on the couch at their neighbor's house with their neighbors for movie night. And it's this kind of dark and gloomy room, and, uh, and they're eating popcorn, and they just have this look of total boredom and misery on their face. But then their surroundings change, and they find themselves in a casino. And, and there's bright lights, and there's gambling tables, and there's good food, and there's fancy clothes, and this couple is now ecstatically happy. And, then, and right as they're throwing their poker chips excitedly up into the air, it snaps back to them being in their neighbor's house for movie night, and they're, they're throwing popcorn all over the room. But then they give themselves this look that says, aha, we know where the fun and the joy is, and it's definitely not here at our neighbor's house. It's someplace else. And next weekend, we're going to go find it. Then the very next commercial kind of started pretty much the same way. It was a couple on their couch. I think this is how TV land just imagines Americans. We're all just sitting at home on our couches, and, and it's this couple sitting on their couch, and they look disgusted with life, but then all of a sudden they are transported to a home improvement warehouse and they're filling their shopping cart with, uh, with tools and you know, bags of soil and, and flowers and then the next thing they're, they're uh, outside planting and digging and, and hammering and building and transforming their backyard into something out of like a home and garden magazine and then the commercial ends with them uh, brushing the dirt off their hands, and then they fall back into their couches, exhausted, but this time they're wearing these smiles of contentment on their face, and they give each other a look that says, aha, we have discovered how to be satisfied inside our home. All it took was reshaping everything on the outside of our home. And then a little bit later, uh, my, my neighbor Dan, who... Um, he manages kind of the AV and tech crew for a local high school for all of their plays and musicals and stuff like that. And he showed me an advertisement from uh, one of the big banks in America that had kind of gotten the arts community stirred into a bit of a frenzy. Did anybody hear about this or, or see this uh, ad? We've got a, a picture of it up here. Um, the ad says, if you can't read it, it says, a ballerina yesterday, an engineer today, an actor yesterday, a botanist today. And apparently this was not such a big hit with the kind of movie and music and theater <laughs> crowd, right? Um, but you can, you can imagine, though, a, a 21st century uh, high-achieving couple of parents seeing this ad and giving each other a look that kind of says like, uh-huh, this is what we have been trying to tell our kids, that they will never find true happiness as a dancer or an actor. That's not good enough. But a botanist, that is someone living the life of adventure. That is, that's what we want out of our kids, right? I apologize to any botany majors in here. That, that, that was very unchristian of me to make fun of you. But all of these ads, right, they are, 
they're selling different things, right? One is trying to get you to come and lose money in their casino. One's trying to uh, get you to come and spend money in their store. One's trying to get you to come and invest money in their bank. But all of these products that, that they're trying to sell, they're all using the exact same message pretty much. What they're telling you is that your life stinks, right? That your life is incomplete. It's not whole. You're headed in the wrong direction, but don't worry because we've got the solution and it's available for you at a very low, low price and it can all be yours. And, and it tells us that there is a way to live our life that promises to deliver meaning and fulfillment from the outside in, right? There's a way of living your life that that tells us that if you just arrange and, and rearrange all of the external parts of your life in just the right way, your internal life will have peace and joy. So that, those commercials, they kind of started to have an effect on me. Even though I was having a really good time with my neighbors in their living room watching football, a part of me started to wonder when I saw that casino commercial if, if I couldn't be having a better time watching the game while throwing dice and laying bets on the over-under. You know, a part of me was starting to think that maybe, maybe real joy wasn't here in my neighbor's living room. Maybe it was someplace else. And then, and then the commercial about the home improvement store, it kind of started making me think about my own yard. And I started to worry that all of these cars driving up and down the street, they might not be slowing down to take in all of nature's beauty when they passed my house. You know, I started to worry that maybe my yard was actually making them speed up and drive erratically to get away as fast as they can. And, and so I kind of started to have this spirit of discontentment about my yard, a yard that I actually liked quite well before the commercial came on. But then I saw that commercial and I started to think, well, maybe, maybe true contentment means I need to have something else. And then that bank advertisement made me kind of kind of question my deeply held aspirations to one day be a prima ballerina, you know, and no, I'm just kidding. It didn't make me question that. Those, those aspirations are unshakable in me, okay? It's going to happen one day. But it did make me kind of think about, you know, my own vocation, which is kind of, you could kind of see ministry as kind of falling into that humanities and arts sphere, and it kind of made me wonder, is my vocation the best thing for me? I mean, is my best self something that can only be achieved if I become someone else, someone a little bit more respectable? There's a book in the Bible called Ecclesiastes, and tradition holds that it was written by King Solomon, who's often regarded as kind of the wisest character in the Old Testament. Um, there's a book called Proverbs, which is a collection of wise sayings that's also attributed to Solomon. But listen to how Ecclesiastes begins. These are the first words of the book of Ecclesiastes. Meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Has that ever been your life verse before? Raise your hand. You ever felt that way about the world or about maybe the way that you were living or about the way things were going? The writer goes on to talk about uh, some of the things that he gave his full time and attention to, things like hard work and labor and pursuing pleasure and, and study and learning and, and creating and developing these great works of architecture and even acquiring wisdom. And what Solomon determined was that after all of this, after all of these pursuits, everything was utterly meaningless. This is how he concludes this whole section on how he was living his life. So I hated life. Because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, nothing but a chasing after the wind. It's kind of a depressing piece of scripture, isn't it? It's not something that we would like write in the front of a third grade Bible that we're going to give out next week. You know, hey, Billy, remember that everything's meaningless, you know, read your Bible. Um, but I think what it kind of says, and what maybe Solomon kind of eventually realized is that ultimately, whenever we attempt to find fulfillment by living from the outside in, we always end up discovering that life is a little bit meaningless. But fortunately, there's another way. Fortunately, there is the Jesus way, which lives life and discovers meaning and fulfillment from the inside out. 
And when Jesus was once asked where people could find this meaning, where people could find what, what they called the kingdom of God, Jesus replied by saying, God's kingdom isn't coming with signs that are easily noticed. People aren't going to say, look, here it is, or look, there it is. Don't you see the kingdom of God is within you? And what I think Jesus is talking about here is our soul. What he's saying is that the fullness of God's kingdom, that all of God's love and, and joy and peace and life, that all of that has made a home within us in the very core of who we are. And at our core, we're not a heart, we're not a mind, we're not a body. At our core, we are a soul. See, when, when God created the world, God made some creatures to, to just be a body, right? They have impulses and, and drives and responses, but that's kind of about it. They don't even really know that they're alive. And then God made other creatures that have a, a body, but they also have a mind. They, they can bring in data from the outside world and assess it and, and think about their environment and make some decisions about where to go and what to do so that they might not just survive, they might actually thrive. And then God made even more creatures, some that don't have just bodies and minds, but God also gave them the capacity to have feelings and to have emotions. These creatures are able to build relationships with other creatures. And what we say about those creatures is that they have a heart, right? They have a heart and we give them names and we keep them in our homes as pets and we call these creatures dogs. Not dogs and cats because see, God didn't give a heart to cats. God, cats. And that, that, that comes straight from the Bible, folks. I can't remember what book it's in, but I know. I know it's there. Cats don't have the capacity for feelings and emotions. But then there's one final category of creatures that God made called human beings. And what the scripture says is that when we were fashioned from the dust of the earth, God did something with us that God did not do with anything else in all creation, that God formed us in the image of God. And that God breathed into us the divine breath of life and it's this breath of life that created a soul in each and every one of us and it's the soul within us that connects us with the soul of God think about what we mean whenever we talk about something having soul to it or, or something being good for our soul if a song has soul what we're saying is that is that somehow in some way it kind of resonates with the deepest parts of what it means to be a human. And soul food, we call that soul food because it's got a way of kind of comforting us and warming us at the very core of each and every one of us. And if we say that someone is an old soul, what we really mean, what we're trying to say is that, is that in some way that we can't really put into words, there's just something about this individual that, that they have a connection to something so ancient and so central to who we are, because it's our souls, it's our souls, not our bodies, not our hearts, not our minds, it's our souls that connect us to the life and to the spirit of God. And look, we can, we can experience God and we can, we can grow in the love and the knowledge of God with our bodies, with our minds, with our hearts, but you see, it's that the grace, that transforming grace that comes from, from God flows to us to those parts of ourselves through our soul. That's how God connects with us. That's how God ends up connecting with our hearts and our minds and our bodies because God moves through our soul. Dallas Willard, the late philosopher and uh, minister and author, he said this, he said, what is running your life at any given moment is your soul. Not external circumstances, not your thoughts, not your needs, not even your feelings, but your soul. The soul is that aspect of your whole being that correlates, that integrates, that enlivens everything going on in the various dimensions of the self. The soul is the life center of human beings. 
And I think the reason that, that he says that the soul is the life center of human beings is because it's our soul that connects us to the center of all life, which is God. And sometimes the soul that, that's working to integrate all those other parts of us, sometimes sin can enter and disintegrate us. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more next week and the week after. But, but sometimes, you know, sometimes our bodies can become the center of our lives and, and we can live our lives and they can become run by just our appetites and our hungers and our kind of carnal desires. Sometimes it's our minds that become the center and we start to think that if we can just get the right answers and if we can just come up with the most creative ideas, if we can have the right mindset, then we'll finally have peace in our life. And, and sometimes, sometimes we seek that peace, we seek that wholeness just with our hearts and we convince ourselves that life will be best if we just pursue our passions, if we just go after whatever those things are that make us feel good. But you see, all of those things, all those ways of, ways of living are based on the notion that ultimate fulfillment and meaning can only be found if we go somewhere else or if we get something else or if we become someone else. They're all different ways of convincing us that the kingdom of God is not where Christ says it is is inside us, within us, in our soul. Here's Willard again, and I'll, I'll probably be coming back to this guy, Dallas Willard, a lot over the next 10 weeks. He's kind of just a, a master of the life of the soul. But here's what Dallas Willard said. We think that we have to be someplace else or that we have to accomplish something more to find peace but peace is right here. God has yet to bless anyone except for right where they are. Your soul is not something that lives on after your body dies. Your soul is the most important thing about your life because your soul is your life. And we're calling this series over the next 10 weeks, Soul Matters, because we believe that the soul, our soul matters more than anything else in all the world. And Jesus talked a lot about this in his ministry. One day he, he said, don't be afraid of those things that can kill the body but cannot harm the soul. Instead, beware of those things that can kill your soul. And a little while later, he said, what, is it, what does it profit someone to gain the whole world if they lose their soul? What good is it to, to have everything on the outside if we lose what's on the inside? Your soul is the most important part of you. And we want to be a church more than anything else full of healthy souls. Because we believe that if our souls are healthy, then our bodies will be healthier, our minds will be healthier, our, our hearts, our ministries, our missions, everything that we do together here will be healthy if our souls are healthy and God has given each and every one of us a soul. And look, when we neglect it, when we neglect our soul, and when we, whenever we try to live life from the outside in, when we try to find fulfillment in places other than God, we end up like Solomon, we end up discovering emptiness in unrest, in a sense of meaninglessness. But, but God says that whenever we return to our soul, whenever we tend to our soul, whenever we care about the matters of our soul and when we try to live our lives from the inside out, then we find the fulfilling joy and peace and life that God intends for each and every one of us and that God has breathed into the very soul of us. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Gracious and loving God, what a gift. What a gift are our souls. The fact, God, that we can connect with the creator of all life and that we don't need to go somewhere else and we don't need to have something else and we don't need to become someone else to access your grace and your love. Lord, over these next 
several weeks together, help us call our attention, turn our whole being to the matters of the soul. May we discover, Lord, the, the truth that your kingdom, that everything that we need to not only survive, but to thrive and to flourish is within us. That it's your grace flowing from your soul through ours that sustains every single part of us. God, we give you thanks for your word and for your truth and for your presence with us. And it's in the name of Christ that we ask this prayer. Amen.